the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands with which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature of God's, of natures of God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Those are the opening words of the Declaration of Independence. And there's a truth that's lying there, that has always been lying there. We are very suspicious of authority. Perhaps America has always been suspicious of authority, Ever since these words were written down, there's countless and countless of occasions where we can see our suspicion rising up with controversy. The JFK assassination. Who did it? How many shooters? 9-11, was it an inside job? Pearl Harbor, did we know beforehand? Was the election rigged? What about the Illuminati? Are they out there in that secret room conniving together, how they may rule the world together. Even today, I was joking with a uh, church member about uh, his shirt. I had uh, a comment about flat earth. There was, the earth is flat. The landing on the moon, how was the flag waving? We don't know. There's not air, but, you know, it's, it was filmed in a basement in Hollywood. Even to the conspiracy, birds aren't real. This idea of being suspicious of authority, those in power have not stayed outside the church walls, but they've even come inside the church. Perhaps you, perhaps even I, are suspicious often of those who are in authority. Uh, years ago, there was a podcast that became uh, famous for a short time called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, which followed the uh, church plant based in Seattle of Mars Hill, where this meteoric rise of this church quickly came down because of misuse of authority. And those who were listening often became suspicious of authority in the church. I had a friend I talked to recently this week about this sermon, about my opening illustration, and he said while he was planting a church, he was listening to that podcast, and he even became suspicious of himself. Was, he, was his authority good? Yet they still planted the church. And yet we still have a government. After writing the Declaration of Independence, a few years passed by, and they're electing a president. Because while we may be suspicious of authority, some warranted, some not, we understand authority is good. And it's needed. And as we look to God's word, it tells us not to reject authority, but tells us what good authority looks like. What, what those who want to aspire to be an authority, what they should aspire, what their characteristics should be, and those who are looking to put people in authority, what should they look for in a person that they want to have over them? Tonight's text, we're going to see great authority. We're going to see a great king. That is the title of tonight's message the great king, and the main point of this, of this message is the Lord is helping his people see the greatness of the king. This is why this text here is why the author has put it here to show us what a great king looks like and what we should look for in a great king. We're going to break this down into two points. I'm going to give them to you right now, no spoilers. I mean, spoiler alert, here we go. First point, the greatness of the king, point one. And the second point, the need for a great king. So here we're going to have a first point, the greatness of the king. We're going to see different reasons the uh, author is giving us that we, sh we should see the greatness in the king, primarily here in the text, in King David. This is what he's doing in this text. He is going to simply go, we're going to go through this chapter, and he's going to show you, man, look how great King David is. Look how great. King David is. We see this in verses 1 through 5. It says, Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. 
And the Lord said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. The first way we see how great King David is, the king is so great because he unites God's people. The king is so great is because he unites God's people. We see that. The civil war that's been happening here in Israel is done. It's over. Saul has died, and then there was an uh, uprising. Ishbosheth is taking over. Abner is leading them, and then they're all dead. And now Israel has no one left to rule over them, and so they make their way to Hebron where David has established his kingdom over Judah. The northern and southern tribes, they are now coming together under one king, the king David. The civil war is over. There is peace in Israel. The golden age of Israel is about to begin. The greatness of the king is about to be seen for years to come. The people will be no longer against one another, but they will be unified under one king, King David. And it's very interesting, right, the remarks they make about him. They don't just say, all right, it's time for you to be our king. They tell him what God has said about him. Right? It says here, it says, and the Lord said to you, they have come to be under God's word, what God has declared You shall be shepherd of my people, Israel. This is the first time this title is given to the king of Israel here. You will be the shepherd. God's king will unite God's sheep under one shepherd. We see that in verse 2. The king's job, therefore, is to what? It's to be a good shepherd. What does a good shepherd do? The good shepherd, well, it says very clearly, cares for God's sheep. He used to be a prince, or a, that word means a leader of the sheep. And it's very interesting, there must be quite comfort in those words for Israel, right, who have been at war. He says, the Lord said, you shall be shepherd of my people, Israel. They aren't David's people. Whose people are they? They're the Lord's people. Israel is finding comfort in going to David because they are God's people. And David has seen this. David has realized this, has he not? This is why he keeps killing messengers, coming to him, telling him, guess what happened to Saul? He's like, you're dead. Guess what happened to Ishmael? Kill him. God doesn't want to hear about his, God's people dying and being killed and killing one another. This is why David has not been doing any of it. He's been sitting back and letting God do what he wants through sinners. But, It's time for David's reign, and he will shepherd his people. This is very interesting. This is a very direct contrast to Saul. Uh, When we found Saul, he was uh, looking for donkeys that he couldn't find. (laughs) And Samuel's like, they're found. Don't worry about them. But where do we find David? Well, he's out shepherding his father's flock. He's caring for his father's sheep. And now the Lord has taken him from uh, shepherding uh, the sheep of, his, of Jesse to shepherding the flock of Israel. If you turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 34, 1 through 6, this is coming later. We're going to see this idea of this, this has been established now in Samuel that the leader of Israel is to shepherd God's people. And so we're going to see later a prophecy over the leaders of Israel who are not doing this. We see this in Ezekiel chapter 34. Verses 1 through 6. And the word of the Lord came to me. The Son of Man prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say them even to the shepherds. Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because 
There was no shepherd. And then became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. There, we get a, a glimpse of what this job description looks like for David based on Ezekiel saying what they weren't doing. What are they to do? They're, they're supposed to be guiding the sheep. The sheep are to follow the shepherd as he guides them. The shepherd's to provide for the sheep, right? It says they weren't feeding them. He wasn't bringing them to water and caring for them. Instead, what they were doing, the shepherds of Israel were using the sheep. The shepherds were abusing the sheep for their own gain. They were not caring for the sheep. Instead, they were uh, caring for themselves. And we see that, right, instead of using and abusing them, they're actually supposed to be protecting the sheep. Friends, if you're looking for uh, qualified elders, if you're looking for what elders are to be or people who are to shepherd God's people, here's our description. here to guide, to provide, and to protect. David is to guide the people, to provide for the people, and to protect God's people. But it's very clear they don't understand there in Ezekiel whose sheep they are. In Ezekiel here in this text, it's the Lord's sheep. They are the Lord's people. The elders of the church were under shepherds. And that's all we can be, and that's all we want to be. For we know we belong to the Lord. For the chief shepherd has purchased us with his blood. And then we see again in Psalm 23, this job description being laid out for us. What is this shepherd to do? What is David to look like with this rule now that he's uniting the kingdom as one people under one shepherd? Well, Psalm 23 tells us what? He is to give us rest, to lead us to green pastures where our hunger will be satisfied. He is to lead us to still waters where what? Our thirst can finally be quenched. He is to restore our souls. He is to lead us to walk in righteousness. David is to guide them through difficulty and in the midst of difficulty, comfort them. David has a tall task, but we are to look here at what David is meant to do. The Lord said to David, you will shepherd my people. There's another interesting note here in verse 4 that David was 30 years old and he begins to reign. This is setting high expectations for the great shepherd of Israel. 30 is not here by incident. Joseph, the shepherd, when he became ruler over Egypt, second command of Pharaoh, he was 30 years old. The prophet Ezekiel, when his ministry began, he was 30 years old. Saul began his kingship at 30 years old. The Levitical priesthood began officially at 30 years old. There is a great expectation for the priest King David to begin at 30 years old. This may seem like just simple biography information, but it's setting very high expectations of what we should have for the king of Israel who begins his reign at 30 years old. And then again, here we are in verses 6 through 10, where the author is meant to give us more reasons that we should see how great this king is. The king is so great because he overthrows and establishes strongholds. He's going to overthrow strongholds, and he's going to establish his own. We see that in verses 6 through 10. It says, And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, You will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. And David sat on the, said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul. Therefore it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. And David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built the city all around from, the, from Milo inward. And David became greater and greater, for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. There's two primary things that are happening in these verses. He is overthrowing and he is establishing. I don't think I have uh, read 
um, verses uh, six at all since I began, since I knew I was going to preach this text without laughing. It makes me giggle every time. Uh, the Jebusites, right, who are uh, over Jerusalem, David, King David, who has killed his tens of thousands, they're like, David's coming to them. He's like, you know how we're going to defend Jerusalem against David? We'll put the, the, the uh, blind and the lame out there. That's who's going to protect us. Because they're, they're kind of jesting at David. This is the, their way of goading him of there's no way you can come in here. The blind will take care of you. And, uh, and once again, this poetic battle, uh, David then turns this phrase against them saying, all right, it's time to go kill the blind and the lame because they just called themselves blind and lame. David is, all right, if you want to call yourself blind and lame, we'll kill the blind and the lame. All right, like, guys, let's go kill the blind and the lame. That's what they're full of. They're full of the blind and the lame to me. And so there's this phrase, we must go up the water shaft. So this is some think this is how David overtook Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a stronghold. David will establish this as a stronghold, a city that will be hard to take over and so, but David has found it in Inway, apparently through this water tunnel, they established it, and this is how they overthrow Jerusalem. He overthrows the city. And this is a remarkable thing. Once again, the author is trying to show you how great David is, because the Jebusites have been the Jebusites in Jerusalem from the beginning, right? When Joshua is going in and conquering the promised land, Judah's taking over, but guess who they can't get out? The Jebusites. The judges, guess who they can't get out? The Jebusites. Guess who Saul doesn't try to get out? The Jebusites. But David has begun his reign. The king is now here to conquer, and he's clearing out the promised land. He's doing what no one else could do before. He is freeing his people. He is cleansing the land. The judges were not able. Saul didn't try. But David has conquered Jerusalem. He has founded Mount Zion, the mountain that the Lord has chosen. And, he is, and what does he do right after this? He says he establishes it as the capital of his nation. David, you can't come in here. Yeah, but I need a place for a capital, so I'm going to have to come in there. And so what does he do? He conquers, and he says, I'm going to establish this place as capital. It's a very good political thing he's doing, beginning his reign. Uh, it's in the central part of Israel over the kingdom. It's in the very center. And it's where uh, Judah was not, and it's where Israel is not, right? The Jebusites are there. And so now he is establishing a peaceful way to unite uh, all of Israel under this one city, uh, all of uh, Israel under this one city, uh, Jerusalem. This is the first time in the Old Testament that Zion is noted. But as I just mentioned, it'll be mentioned later. It is the mountain that the Lord has chosen for his people. This is the beginning. David is beginning his reign. Jerusalem is being established. Mount Zion is being chosen. He is exercising dominion over the land. What we're seeing David is doing is exercising the rights that he's had from Adam, the first priest king, where the land where God, or in the garden where God walked with his people. We see it kind of shadowed later on, on Mount Sinai in the tabernacle where God will dwell with his people. And now here is the beginning. The Lord, through David, is cleansing out the land he is building his city, and the temple will be built, the ark will be brought in, and a new garden will be established. We are seeing a new, somewhat of a new Adam, a new priest king, where God can dwell in the promised land, the land of milk and honey, and walk with his people again. And we see an interesting note there in verse 10. And this is primarily where I'm getting that what the main point is, is showing how great David is. It says uh, there in verse 10, and David became greater and greater. This is what the author is trying to tell us. And he tells us not only how he's becoming greater, but why he is becoming greater. What is, or not just why, but how he's becoming greater. For the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. It is no secret. David has no secret. The Lord. The Lord is how I'm doing it. 
And it's not just the Lord, it's the God of hosts. How does God, or how does David conquer? Because the God of armies is with him. Saul's house is getting weaker and weaker, but David's house is getting stronger and stronger. Here we go in in verses 11 through 12. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees, also carpenters and, and masons who built David a house. And David knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and that he exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. And David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came from Hebron. And more sons and daughters were born to David. And these are the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem. Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elashua, Nepheg, Jephiah, Elishama, Eliada, and Eliphel. So what's happening here is uh, a couple of things. We are seeing uh, David's house growing and getting stronger, and we're also seeing the nations being subject to him. There are two main ways we're seeing uh, the greatness of the king. One here, the nations are subject to the king of Israel. This will be really established from here on out, Psalm 2, many psalms, many prophecies, when the Christ is going to come, the king of David, Israel will be established as a world power and the king will reign and bring peace and joy, not just to Israel, but to the whole world under the rule and reign of the king of Israel. And here we're seeing a picture of this. Hiram, the king of Tyre, a a Gentile, is coming and subjecting himself to the king and giving to the king and, uh, and blessing the king. And he's going to be blessed. Because those who bless him will be blessed, and those who curse him will be cursed. God is showing us here that the great king uh, of Israel will be king of the world. It's not enough that God rules Israel. He wants the world. David is not clueless of what's happening He understands the gravity of what's before him. It says that in verse 12. Then when this Gentile comes to him, he knows that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel, for the sake of God's people. The Lord is raising up David to be be a blessing to his people. Verses 13 through 16 God, uh, David's great house is growing. It's growing numerically. So he's, he, uh, one of those signs of uh, power and authority is that his people are increasing and increasing. This is in direct contrast to Saul's house that's been happening, right? One by one, uh, people in Saul's house, generals are being killed, sons are being killed, uh, or, or they're, being, they're crippled and lame. And then in verses 17 through 25, we're going to see a, a last really sub-point of this first point, right, of the greatness of the king. The great king, he defeats God's enemies. He's so great that he defeats God's enemies. We see this in verses 17 through 25. It says, When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephahim. And David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And David came to uh, Baal-perazim, and David defeated them there. and And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. Therefore, the name of the place is called Baal Perazim, and the Philistines left their idols there, and David and his men carried them away. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread out in the valley, in the valley of Rephahim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, "You shall not go up; go around to the rear and come against them, the opposite of uh, balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees." Then rouse yourself, for, the Lord, for then the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as the Lord commanded him, and struck down the Philistines from Geba to Gizer. The great king defeats 
God's enemies. God's enemies are coming into God's land for God's people. And it says primarily for God's anointed. The Philistines heard that David had been anointed king. And this is when they come. They spread themselves out all around Jerusalem. That's where that valley is. And so what does David do? He gets his army and he goes and attacks. No. He prays. He inquires of the Lord. This has a, been a pattern all throughout Samuel showing uh, David's nature, his humility. He prays to God. And then he goes. Before he acts, he prays. David prays and then goes. He prays and then goes. He prays. David is a prayer. I think there's something there for us, perhaps. And then we see something here. After he prays, what does he do? He listens to God and obeys. David prays and then listens to what God has to tell him, and that's what he does. I feel like he's trying to tell us something here. David takes the Philistines first, head on, because that's what God tells him to do, and he defeats them. Right? We see this. Verse 20, David, David defeated them. The Lord had broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. This, this language can be used next uh, chapter against, against Israel. But this right now, it's, a, it's against his enemies. He's breaking forth. He's breaking out on the enemies uh, of God. In verse 22, right, he meets him head, first he meets him head on, and he just takes him out because God says, you got him. But then it says they come out again, and when uh, David prays, he says, no, no, don't go head on. Uh, go around from behind. Why? Is God not capable of just straight up, you know, killing the Philistines again? There's something there because he, he says, I'm going to give you a sign, Right? When the balsam trees, when you hear them rousing up, like, like someone's marching ahead of you, that's when you go. Why? God is giving them a gracious, physical sign to show his people, I'm going before you. I'm conquering your enemies. David, I'm taking your enemies and I'm putting them under you as a footstool. The Lord is kind and not just giving them a victory, but then giving them another, another victory where they can see it was clearly in the hands of the Lord conquering uh, his enemies. And what did we see happening here in verse 21? And the Philistines left their idols there, and David and his men carried them away. I think what's happening is a reversal from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. What happened was earlier, the Israelites, went, when they're fighting the Philistines, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was left. And the Philistines took the Ark in with their idols. Which, which next chapter will happen, uh, God doesn't need his people. He just takes he, famine and plague and takes Dagon and smashes them. And it's like, oh, I think God can handle this by himself. He doesn't need us. But here what we're seeing is a reversal. Now it's the Philistines who are leaving, not the Ark, but their idols behind. And God is conquering their gods and their idols. This is a great king. God is establishing a great king. He unites God's people. He overthrows strongholds. He establishes a new temple for God's presence to dwell with his people. He's bringing in the Gentiles. He's being fruitful and multiplying, growing his house. He's defeating God's enemies and idols. And any who would stand in his way, and this great king trusts the Lord, and the Lord is making David greater and a greater king. David is a great king. But this text shows us that we need a greater king. It is not David alone who will bring rest for his people. He is not the promised offspring of Genesis 3.15, the snake crusher. We need another. Verse 5 tells us, at Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. That's a long reign. Not long enough. David will die. 
We should look for another king. David is great, and he is establishing a pattern for us that we may look for another king like David. We're also reminded that we need another king, not just because of the, uh, the ending of his reign, that David's not here now reigning, but verses 13 through 16, I think it is establishing that his house is growing, but it's also the author of Samuel has been doing this throughout uh, 1 and 2 Samuel with David just subtly, like, like a, a movie director in a movie, right? He doesn't just give you the ending conflict. He kind of gives you hints throughout, kind of uh, foreshadowing something's coming. And what's coming is 1 Samuel 11. David has trouble with women, and it will be his downfall. And he is directly going against Deuteronomy 17. Uh, Deuteronomy 17, verse 17, given to, about, uh, concerning Israel's kings, and he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Guess what happens? He acquires many wives, and his heart is turned away. The author has continually been dropping hints that while God is exalting this lowly shepherd boy, David's fall is coming in chapter 11. We should look not to David, but to David's son. He will be prophesied in a few chapters later in 2 Samuel 7. The son of David in 2 Samuel will be also the, God will see him as a son, the son of God who will reign forever. His throne will be established forever. He will be like David, a son of David, and his name is Jesus Christ. He will be the shepherd of God's people. He will be the good shepherd. He will make he will be a good shepherd. He will be a prince of peace. He will make a better covenant with his people than the one David made with his people here. His reign will not end. He will reign forever. And he will establish a new kingdom. He will establish a new Jerusalem, a better Jerusalem, a city of peace where the gates will not close. They will always be open for his enemies will have been defeated. And the streets there will be made of gold where there Gentiles and Jews alike will come and gather around one throne and sing one song to a good shepherd, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Jesus is the one who will conquer his enemies truly and completely, the one who also not only conquers his enemies by defeating them, but conquers his enemies by forgiving them and saving them, and that any that we who were once his enemies, if we will repent of our sin and place our faith in him, he will forgive us. For behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe because the great king, Jesus Christ, has conquered. He has taken our sins and paid for them. How? Well, he died for them on the cross. And he was raised and he is seated on an eternal throne. And friends, that is not the end. He has been raised, but he is coming again. And not to this time offer forgiveness, but to take his people into his kingdom and establish justice in his land to his enemies who have not repented of their sins and have not repented of their idol worship. There he will take them and their idols and he will throw them in the lake of fire with Satan and his angels and the smoke will go up forever and ever. And then finally, our greatest enemy, death itself, will be thrown in. Friends, there is good news here in 2 Samuel chapter 5. And we need to take this good message of this great king and we need to apply it to our, our lives and establish it in our hearts that maybe this week we would cling to these promises and these truths. Christ Jesus is our good shepherd. I know we're out of time, but we're going to go there anyways. John chapter 10, truly, truly, I say to you, who does not enter, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. He calls them his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes before them, and his sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they didn't know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used to them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, 
I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is the hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Friends, 2 Samuel 5 is trying to give us a promise, a look for this great king, a good shepherd. I'm reminded often through all the scripture here, and even in my own life, he's the good shepherd. He leaves the 99 for the one. I love the message of Luke 15, the, the, the lost parables. He's like a shepherd who goes and gets a sheep. And the sheep don't walk back. The shepherd puts them on his shoulders. And he graciously carries them back into the fold. Friends, have you been wondering? Have you gone hungry and thirsty? Well, you can rest knowing you have a good shepherd. He sees you hurting. He sees your needs, and he wants to bind your wounds. He wants to wipe your tears away, and one day he will do it, fully and completely. Our Christ is a good shepherd. He unifies his people. Friends, remember the promises here in 2 Samuel 5. He will unite us as in one flock. Bear with one another. Rejoice one another this week. Send a text. Send a, call someone on the phone. Invite someone over. Hear their burdens. Hear their celebrations. Because we are one flock under one shepherd. And we can show the world that how good our God is. And that we are his disciples. But how we love one another. David wants here the Gentiles and the Israelites. Christ wants the world. Go make disciples of all nations. Friends, go tell the gospel to the lost around you. Go to your coworkers. Go to your neighbors. Because he has established, he has authority over the world. What's not his? They're his people. They're his sheep. They're not under that fold at the time, but they're in his fold. And he must get them also. And he will use the likes of you and me. Pray for the nations. They're his. He rules them. And many of them just don't know it yet. And Christ is like David, and he conquers his enemies, and he gives his people rest. Maybe that doesn't mean a lot to you. Maybe you haven't realized you have an enemy. Friends, the, your phones, your screens, the world around us does not want us to fight. It wants you to coast through life. Friends, we have enemies. We have an enemy. We have Satan. We have the world trying to draw us in with comfort. And we have our enemy in ourselves, our flesh. But the king conquers. He's conquered on the cross. He has conquered with the empty tomb. Friends, come and, and savor this great feast. But perhaps this doesn't mean a lot to you because you have not been fighting Perhaps we have been like Israel, if you're like me, and confronted by this text, not realizing Jebusites are in the land, living with enemies among us. This king will not allow other idols in his land. This king will not allow the Jebusites in his promised land. 
He hates them. He hates them. It's very clear he does not want other gods. And so, friends, if you're hurting, if you're tired of fighting, keep fighting. Fight your sin. Kill your sin. Kill your sin. Put it to death. The king bids you fight and kill because he has already won. You can fight knowing that your enemy has been defeated and one day sin and death will be destroyed and you have to fight no longer. There will be rest for his people. The great king will gather his sheep and one day he will present us before himself holy and blameless. And we will get to walk before the king. And mine are keys to Zion City. Where beside the king I walk. For there my heart has found its treasure. Christ is mine forevermore. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are good and you have given us a great king. And you have given us a good shepherd. Oh Lord, help us this week to once again bow our knees before the great, the great and gracious and awesome king. Let us bring our idols willingly to his feet that he may destroy them. That we may live uh, with joy and peace and rest with our good shepherd, Jesus Christ. And it's our good and gracious king, Jesus Christ, in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, if you have your hymnal, turn to 202. All, all hail the power of Jesus' name. <laughs>